Europe. It's definitely not a completely boring subject, but it's also not something sexy to talk about. Am I right? And what is even less sexy is to talk about European identity. But I'm still going to do it, so bear with me. If I were to ask all of you here, where would you come from? How would you identify? You would probably say you're Amsterdamer or Berliner, you're Dutch, or Polish or Hungarian. But almost no one would say that they would feel European first and foremost. And it's also pretty difficult because identity is a pretty complex concept. Um, but it's increasingly visible and a spare point in debates. Whether it's your local village or your city, your progressive or your conservative values, your sexual orientation or your job, we constantly build upon our identity and we're being reinforced by it. Identity and politics are completely intertwined nowadays. And for many of us, identity is a combination of local and national or regional and European or global identification processes. But it's the, this last one, Europe, that we don't really talk about. We talk about politics, about economics. We never really talk about what it means to be European. And also, the concept of Europe itself isn't that clear cut. What does it mean? What, where does it start? Where does it end? Who's a part of it? And we often talk about the political dimension of Europe, sure. We talk about who joins. We talk about who leaves. We also always, in the end, eventually talk about the economic dimension, right? In any case, we talk about the cultural dimension way too little. And I feel that's a shame because we should combine these three dimensions, the political, the economic, and the cultural, in order to truly facilitate European cooperation and mutual understanding. So back in 2015, I just graduated from university college and with some other AUC alumni, we went to Barcelona to film a documentary about the Catalan regional elections. At the time, they were already considered a de facto referendum on independence. It was relatively more peaceful than what we saw last year. And there's one image I will never forget. It was a sea of tens of thousands of people holding up Catalan, Spanish, and European flags. And all these young Catalans that we interviewed, they all told us that even though they disagreed on many topics, including independence, they all said that they felt European. And this really surprised us. Because it's not something you hear that often, right? Let me go back. We often talk about what, is mean, what does it mean to European, what does it mean to be European in a very black and white way, right? Identi identity politics itself are very simplified and brought to the bare bones. You're either this or you're either that. And in the words of UK Prime Minister Theresa May, you're either a citizen of your country or you're a citizen of nowhere. And the French counterpart or from France, Marine Le Pen, she said, it's now between globalists and patriots. And we do it ourselves, right? We, the progressive thinkers, we often say that we feel this and we feel that. And the other side is conservative or homophobic or racist. Think about it. Identity is often black and white, right or wrong. It's not given a lot of room for detail, color, and complexity. And that's a shame because it leaves no room for those who feel Catalan and European, Barcelonian and Spanish. It leaves no room for those of us who, doesn't, who don't want to restrict our identity to the country on our passport. And what we're left with are these very vocal camps the camps of, we are pro-Europe, and we are against. But nobody simply asks the question, who are we? Europe is missing a face, but we can give it one, just like we did with all these other countries and national identities that we created over the years. They're all built on a collection of stories. Take Italy, for example. Massimo da Seglio in 1866, he famously said, we have made Italy, now we must make Italians. 
150 years ago, the city-states of Milan and Rome, they didn't share a collective Italian identity. But nowadays, they share pizzas and vespas, and that's the Italian story. The same goes for France. During the French Revolution, only 3 million of the 25 million people who lived in France at the time, they spoke what we now think of as French. The Parisian leaders, the French leaders, they saw this and they decided to change this and they created Frenchness, La France, out of a mishmash of local cultures and dialects. Et voila, we now even talk about French being the number one language of Europe, right? And Germany, Albania, Greece, Turkey, the United States of America, they all do the same. Identities can be created, identities are created. Back in 1950, one of the founding fathers of the European Union, Jean Monnet, he said, Europe has never existed. One must genuinely create Europe. So they started, and throughout the years, the European Union grew. I don't think they've done a very great job, but it's a start. They're, getting, they're going somewhere. But I feel that Europe is missing a story, so we should go back to its core. We should go back to the essence and go back to this age-old tradition that we're all very familiar with, storytelling. And here, on a TED stage, I don't have to explain the value of storytelling, but I want, to, I want to let us know that we can remind ourselves to tell the story of a shared European experience based on values and the stories we share. And in order to do this, I decided to set up a platform with a lot of other university college alumni and other people, built around precisely this idea. A platform where stories, European stories, personal European stories could be told collectively. We call it our Collective European Storytelling Project. And we combine the stories of a young Slovak and his few on Europe, the a photo series about anarchists and left-wing Hamburg, and the thoughts of a Lithuanian artist into a podcast. We're driven by one question, which is also our name, are we Europe? Because we want to ask questions rather than proclaim we know the answers. We don't know what Europe is. We don't know who we are. It's pretty clear we don't know that, right? So you might ask yourself, so what does it mean to be European? Have we figured out yet? Definitely not. It's an ongoing search and we've just started. But what we do know is that when we talk about Europe, it's often about the political and the economic dimension. But we forget the one-of-a-kind cultural experiment that Europe is, that the EU is. It is this cultural dimension that the people in Barcelona were talking about and that they were, might have been missing in the last year during another referendum. It is this cultural dimension that I feel is missing from the European story. Europe had a story. The story used to be about progress, about economic cooperation, political integration, more member states, and free data when you're traveling to another country, sure. There used to be a dot on the horizon, a movement, something to work towards. Europe had a story. But in the last 10 years, Europe's story is wavering. It's not really there anymore. We see a gigantic backlash towards the European Union Nationalism is on the rise everywhere. Fences are hastily put up. And the image of fortress Europe is more about protecting us from the other outside our walls than it is about the image of a strong bulwark fighting for freedom and rights amidst the chaos that has engulfed our world on both sides of the continent. It's a pretty sad realization. and. I don't even know if I'm so pro-EU as it is at the moment. But my message is that Europe is so much more than a political or a financial union. Europe exists outside of the EU, and we have to seek this cultural union to truly put some fat on the bones of the skeletal project. No one is better placed to do this than our generation, I feel. Our generation grew up in a Europe without borders and without the freedom, the hypothetical freedom, to travel anywhere. We are the Schengen generation. We are a borderless generation. There are no more checkpoints. 
and controls in Europe. Hypothetically, it's just as easy to board a train to Brussels or fly to London than it is to go to Groningen or Utrecht, right? And these are some of the photos of the old checkpoints. It is this increased connectivity that made me feel more connected to a 20-something from Ljubljana, from Slovenia, than to a 70-year-old man in the Netherlands who might speak the same language, who speaks the same language. And I think that it's this cross-fertilization by this interconnected borderless generation combined with the technological power of the internet that will lead to an interconnectivity on a scale that we have never seen before on the old continent. And we must use this, we must harness this in order to tell the European story a little better. Our generation must take it upon their shoulders to first imagine, then debate and shape, and then work towards a collective European future with a joint purpose built on the values that we share and the stories that we hear from each other and that we tell ourselves. This is the new narrative that Europe needs in these stormy tides. And this new narrative, in conclusion, is three times three, right? It's storytelling, it's listening, and it's sharing experiences. Because if we don't know who the other is, we cannot identify with them. It's a combination of local, national, and European identities. And it's a combination of the political, the economic, and the cultural dimension. Because if we don't look at what we have in common, if we don't listen to each other's stories, in the end, we will always look at what divides us. Especially in Europe, we all know where that leads. And I started off by saying that we want to make Europe sexy, right? Well, I didn't really succeed. I just gave a talk here. But I know that it's not really necessary because I know that the president of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, he's working on the seduction techniques and he might come back as a poll dancer. No, but in all fairness, and all jokes aside, in my eyes, we will have truly succeeded in making Europe sexy if we succeed in collectively turning Are We Europe into We Are Europe. Thank you very much. <laughs>